Welcome to the first public meeting of the Town of Greenwich's Bicycle Task Force. I know we have some people on Zoom, so welcome to the Zoom audience. For those in the room, if I just may ask, please, that you take a seat. So my name is Ernst Schirmer. I'm a bit the moderator for tonight, which is not completely according to plan, because we don't have all the members of the Bicycle Task Force present tonight. Fred Camillo cannot be here tonight. Jill Oberlander, Megan Zaneski, sent her apologies several days ago and cannot make it. Um, Joe Siciliano has been part of that task force in the internal meetings we had so far. Tonight present is um, Jim Michael from the Department of Public Works and the community representatives Stephanie Martin, Trish Clark, and Bob D'Angelo, and again, yours truly, Ernst Schirmer. Given um, the attendance tonight, we need to make some agenda adjustments because I don't really think it's appropriate enough not having the full task force here to make formal recommendations or to solicit really um, decisions. So what we're gonna do is um, to directly jump to agenda item number four and I will call on Trish Clark to please come up and grab the microphone and give us a bit of background um, from a bicycle excursion we took um, going into Byram. Before Trish starts, I'd like to quickly make it public. We had an internal meeting in mid-August, August the 13th, and the major decision out of that meeting was that the task force members will take their bikes and go over to Byram and take a look at the neighborhood, starting from New Lebanon School, go around and see what the current kind of traffic volume, safety, particularly access to school. We also have the Byram Schubert Library over there. Just really general safety with a focus on bicycles and, and pedestrians. And we had a, another internal meeting on September the 2nd where we did a bit initial early sharing of what we saw. And that led actually to the decision that from now on that task force will have all of its meetings, generally in a monthly cycle, in a public way like tonight in a hybrid way. Um, going forward, there will be at least one monthly meeting and it will be on the town's website with you know, the formal agenda and then including minutes. So that's just a working mode, a little bit of history, how we got there to where we are tonight. So I'll pass on to Trish and to really please share what we were able to see in the Byram neighborhood. Thank you. Good evening, can everyone hear me? Um, so the few members of the task force uh, got together on a Saturday in front of New Lebanon School and it was just an exploratory um, excursion where we just biked around uh, the, the elementary school and tried to envision the feasibility of, of um, and, and the safety uh, level of the bike journey to New Lebanon. And while there, uh, we saw a bike rack in front of the school that uh, was partially broken. I think it had space for two bikes, three bikes. It wasn't a lot. And so we already were uh, fairly certain that it wasn't a, a school that had a high percentage of kids that biked to school. And you know, one of the missions of the task force is to just um, obviously increase uh, safety for bikers. Uh, increase awareness on the part of the drivers to watch out for bikers. I think some people, we think people don't feel comfortable biking uh, because of safety concerns. And um, we're, we're hoping to make Greenwich more bike friendly so that more people leave their cars at home. Uh, so what I was left, I was left with the task of polling uh, both the new Lebanon uh, principal and vice principal and um, the, the Western Middle School principal. Just, it was just a poll. And I asked them um, what percentage of their kids arrive by bus, what percentage are dropped off by their parents, what percentage walk, and what percentage either bike or scooter. Um, for Western, uh, that draws a, a larger radius. So the Western Middle School students uh, that came from Glenville Elementary or, or Parkway, it wouldn't be 
that feasible to bike there. So really, um, we wondered if their Hamav kids or their new Lebanon kids would be biking to middle school. Um, so Mr. Uh, Beinstein gave me a pie chart, um, and 53% uh, of the kids uh, are dropped off by a parent. 24% um, come by bus. 18% walk and whatever percentage comes by bike or scooter didn't even have a, a, a number assigned. It was just a little tiny sliver of the pie chart. Um, and then the principal for New Lebanon, um, Alexandra Mickelson, she said only about six or seven kids travel by bus. Um, and she said those are uh, mostly special ed students. She said 60 to 100 are dropped off by parents. 150 to 200 walk, and she said only one or two of the kids bike or scooter. And she said their kids are too little for this, but sometimes they come with a parent on a scooter. Um, but again, maybe it's not commonly done at that school, but that doesn't mean it, it can't be done. I know my kids went to Old Greenwich School and there were at least 30 or 40 bikes uh, every day. I know Stephanie's uh, third grader bikes to Riverside School every day independently. But again, another um, reason why we just want to increase awareness as to the benefits of biking. Obviously, these these schools also have big a lot of walkers. So, from you know walking, biking, who cares? It's you know you're, you're getting exercise and it's good for the environment. But um, I think for people that would be inclined to bike, we want to make sure that they feel safe. Anything else? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish. I'm going to try to do a little bit uh, Zoom artistry because um, I do want to share some slides and hopefully I get them into full screen size mode pretty quickly. Just to visualize a bit, uh, again, thank you, Trish, um, for your formal report before. Uh, on the left side, you can see this mass of signs and even Fred Camillo, when he looked at it, he and I walked away because we weren't really sure are now bicycles allowed at the school or not allowed or they're not allowed during night hours or whatever. So even you know the first impression as to how traffic is coordinated uh, was not a very, very good one. So one possibility is really much, much clearer signage um, Again, the focus was on Byram, so particularly that school. Trish mentioned uh, there's exactly three bike racks that we found. The middle one is obviously not in really in great shape, so who knows where that missing part is. We then proceeded away from New Lebanon School and went to Delavan and towards like exit two. We know there is a current project going, maybe Jim you might want to give a quick update on that project in a moment. But then our focus was really what's the connection into Byram Park or from Byram Park then Byram Shore Road, which is really very beautiful to bicycle and in many ways wide enough and quite safe. I just want to point out that one is when you look at the traffic markings, the white line is always against pedestrians and bicyclists, because obviously the road only has a certain width, and with SUV, SUVs and other vehicles, um, the traffic, the cars just always get priority. On the other hand, this shouldn't really come at the expense of bicyclists or pedestrians, and it certainly always happens around fairly narrow and sharp turns where the views are a bit obstructed. This is a beautiful tree, and we love trees. It's good for the environment, except this one is really blocking, obstructing the view. It's so close to the road. So maybe it's something that we can think about. We found two really good nuggets and jewels, and that is from Byram Show Road coming back. Again, we were wondering from Byram Show Road, uh, how would people potentially bicycle to the library or to school or into more like central Byram? And we found that James Street is very wide. It's a beautiful crossover above 95. So why this road, for instance, was never picked for specific bike lanes as a route to the school, left us just with question marks. 
Uh, River Avenue is next to it. That's another kind of north-south uh, possibility to come across. We then kind of skipped a bit the area of Mead Avenue and headed over to south and ultimately also North Water Street. Many obviously know that from the movies or the Costco warehouse on the other side of the water on the Portchester side. Um, for me personally, an interesting discovery was there's a couple of really nice park and bench areas and so on there. I was a bit surprised um, that they weren't so, so actively used, but that does leave South and North Water Street are very, very challenging, particularly North Water Street, because there's a lot of vehicles that just need to be parked on that road. Not necessarily, obviously, the safe thing for all traffic participants. So that is a bit of a challenge, but I think on South Water Street, there is some improvement possibilities as well. I'm not gonna go into the picture with the boat there because we wanna stay on topic, but uh, some sort of crossing directly into Portchester so that pedestrian bicyclists will not have to be on Mill uh, or Delavan, I think will be very, very helpful, that there will be just a safer connection instead of sending everybody down and up um, Delavan. But that's a little bit a bigger thing. But more immediately again, thinking of New Lebanon itself, Mead Avenue has lots of possibilities. Some measures were taken by the town, I believe. But from there, Mead or the crossroads that lead back to New Lebanon, there's quite some potential just to do really more for channel traffic safety or particularly um, bicyclists or, or, or pedestrians. So I just wanted to give some visuals because it's helpful, but I'd like to come back. One of the patterns that we see throughout Greenwich is just the same. Um, there's a lot of wooden poles. Yes, we need the power and we'd like to have our, you know, fiber optics and internet lines, but some of these poles are really in nearly impossible type of positions. But when it comes to just pedestrian crossings or the markings and so on, um, there, there's, there's a lot of things can do. I will just quickly speak for myself because we didn't really have enough time to deliberate that within the task force. But I would personally see three immediate opportunities in Byram. We can do better signalization around New Lebanon School and make it clear what is permitted bicycling and so on and how and where are the bicycle racks. Number two, um, James Street to me is really a beautiful street, very wide that we don't have some bike lanes there immediately, I quite cannot quite understand. And the third possibility would be to really rethink uh, about Mead Avenue, because I think there's some low hanging fruit and some immediate actions that can be taken. I will stay away from South or North Water Street, because these are formidable challenges there, and the traffic flows and the parking needs um, are really, really, really special. So with that said, um, I know we have Josh Brown, RTM member District 4, but here in the audience we have Lucy von Brockel, who is also part of the Byram Neighborhood Association. I'd just like to invite either Lucy and or Josh, if you'd like to make a comment, give some early reactions, uh, you're very much invited to do that, please. So let us know. We go with you first, Lucy, and then we ascertain whether or not um, Josh, if you wanted to speak, raise your hand, and then we'll pick that up. But Lucy, go first, please. I have to stay a bit away from the microphone. Yeah, I see. I the see. Camera. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you. Uh, this is really great, and Byram does need a lot of assistance with this. Um, we seem to have had an increase in cyclists, mostly in the middle school grades, um, and kids going to and from Western. Um, it is a challenge around New Lebanon because the primary um, routes to get there are so formidable that, um, you know, most of the bike routes that seem somewhat safe, there's something blocking the way that makes it hard for kids to, to ride. And I'm f generally focusing on kids and families in, in this comment. Um, section, but one of the things that I've been finding, um, talking to my son who rides a lot around the neighborhood, which scares me, um, 
you know, he mentioned that kids don't feel safe riding in the, in the road at all, and I know that riding on the sidewalks is illegal, um, but they don't really feel that they have any choice because of the way that cars are parked on our streets kind of um, forces the kids to weave in and out of them, and it's hard for cars to see them. Um, but if they ride on the sidewalks, which aren't that well maintained and um, kind of... Uh, there are so many curb cuts that it's kids actually crash on them quite a bit. Um, and then, as mentioned, there are, are a lot of there's a lot of street furniture uh, that blocks a lot of our main thoroughfares, uh, Byram Road and Delavan and Mill in particular. Um, so, getting people from the Mead South Water Street section of Byram over to the park is a great start and. Um, we fully support that, and you know we are also looking at sort of the bigger picture issues and how we can create um, a safer environment that actually connects these little pockets of safety with each other to get people around the neighborhood on foot and on bike. So, but thank you. This is exciting to us, and and you know we're the neighborhood association is very interested in working with you guys. So. Great, thank you so, so much. Um, hey, Josh, good evening to you. Thank you for joining good us. Evening. Uh, well, thank you for inviting, um, and thank you for hosting. I think this is a very important topic, and I think you've done a great job of highlighting the challenges. Uh, being a new resident in, in Byram, uh, we walk routinely every day um, throughout the, the neighborhood and uh, recognize the challenges of the condition of the street, the curb cuts, the, the narrowness of the streets, and just the volume of trucks, very large trucks. And with the development going on across the river, um, it's gonna be a significant uh, challenge, I think. Um, I think the ideas of what can be done to simplify some of the signage, uh, deal with some of the trees, some of the poles, um, will, will make positive inroads. And I think getting people accustomed to seeing bicyclists and joggers and walkers um, will, will help calm, calm the street and activity. So, um, so brief thoughts, but thank you, and look forward to the continued progress. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, Josh. I sometimes do like to surprise people a little bit. Jim, can you quickly come up, please, and explain to the audience on around Frontage, Delavan, and around Exit 2, what is DPW doing there so that we have a bit of an understanding what kind of project and progress uh, is happening there, please? So like you said, you didn't let me know I needed to talk, so I'm going <laughs> to wing it here a little bit, but um, the project's been a project we've had on the books for over 10 years. It actually was here before I started with the town in 2011. Um, it's primarily a, a little bit of a traffic calming project, but also to improve pedestrian and bike access. So um, we're looking at along Frontage Road, improving the sidewalks, narrowing the lanes a little bit, improving the crosswalks, and then on the one side of the road, which is the 95 side, we're widening that sidewalk over there and making that a multi-use trail from, the, from Byram Road down to um, Byram Park. So um, the sidewalk on that side will be at least eight feet in width so that people can safely cycle on that so moms with kids can cycle and so forth on that stretch. Um, and, you know, so the project started, uh, construction started uh, last week, I believe, and um, we're hoping to get the majority of it completed by the time, um, the end of the year. Um, there will still be some stuff that we'll need to be doing next spring. Part of that is due to the availability of, we're making some minor modifications to the traffic signals at that location. And um, in order to do that, we have to replace some of the um, poles that are there. Those um, have like a close to a 30 week lead time. So that's part of the issue. Um, pretty much anything we're dealing with with steel since you know, over the last year basically has had that 20 to 30 week lead time on anything. So um, that's a general summary of what we're doing there. Um, we hope that when the improvements are done, we do have on the um, 
Public Works website, there's a page dedicated to this project, so you can go on there and see a little bit more about the project um, and uh, take a look at that. And you can always just, um, any questions you might have, you can always email. Um, it's pretty easy, Public Works, all one word, at GreenwichCT.org. So if you have any questions, just send it directly to that and it will find its way to the proper person. Thank you so much, Jim. May I ask you, could you throw in the commercial advertising for Streetscape? Because I'm not sure that's well enough known around town. Would you quickly speak to that as well? Yeah, so, um, so actually part of the Byram project that we were just talking about, we're actually widening the median that's a long frontage road there so that we can improve the trees and so forth there. But other things that we're looking at doing is you know, throughout town trying to um, look at locations where we can provide more streetscape. We recently did a project on Greenwich Avenue at the intersection of Elm Street. We incorporated many, many different streetscape aspects. That's a raised intersection. We have decorative crosswalks there. We significantly increased um, landscaping at that intersection. So these are all features that are streetscape related. And we're looking at various spots throughout town, whether it be Old Greenwich, Byram, um, Cascob, downtown Greenwich, all as locations for potential streetscape projects. Just um, give, you, give you a little explanation about what streetscaping is. So streetscaping basically involves um, taking the road and looking at it from more than just a vehicle for moving vehicles. So it's making sure that rather than just having a bunch of asphalt, you can maybe incorporate. So one example is sometimes you have a nice wide road and when you get to an intersection, you have crosswalks and you maybe have parking on either side of the street. So if you think of, um, let's say, which neighborhood are you from? Riverside. So uh, let me use an example. So if you're going down Sound Beach Avenue near Arcadia and West End, correct? Do you know where I'm talking about in that neighbor? I know that's not Riverside, that's more old Greenwich, but. Uh, yeah, just reoriented, okay. So um, if you're going down there and you get to the intersection of Arcadia and Sound Beach, you have parking along each side of the road. When you get to the actual intersection, the crosswalks are very wide, and that's partially because they were left paved, all the, the curb line was left in one straight line, and so what we can do is we can do what we call bump outs, where we take the area that was parking, but it's not allowed to have parking, and put a landscape island in there, and put some plants in there, possibly put a bench in there, et cetera. So, these are features that help to improve walkability because then what we, by doing that, it shortens the crosswalk width. So you take off maybe 10 feet of width of crossing so it takes you less time to walk across the street. You're not in the road as long. So those are all features there that, um, streetscape also can include adding benches. It can be adding bike racks, it can be adding um, other types of features like that. Um, any sort of, you know, decorative trash cans or any, all that stuff gets lumped into streetscape. It's more like looking at a road as a environment, so. On a streetscape though, it sounds like you're gonna need to step up so that. Uh, or I can repeat the question too, yep. so. Let's repeat the question please. Yeah. So. It sounds like it's more for pedestrian safety. I mean, what is it, what, how does it increase bicycle safety? So the question was, how does streetscape increase bicycle safety? So um, by doing these improvements, it does a mixture of stuff. It helps to slow traffic down in general. So that helps to um, keep vehicles moving slower, which helps to improve the safety of that. You can often incorporate improvements as well, such as the one at Elm Street, we added two bike racks to those corners over there. So that helps to promote bicycle usage in the area, 
provides a safe place for people to park their bikes if they want to park and then walk around the area. Um, depending on the project, you can look into um, possibly other bicycle features that could be added there, um, but those are some of the main features that would be, you know, useful for both pedestrians and cyclists. So the goal is really to kind of slow traffic down, which makes it a safer location. Alex? So I noticed that the street tapes uh, are very environmental and I love them, but they are narrowing the streets and uh, you have curbs on both sides. And yes, there is a bicycle rack, but it's impossible for the bicycle to actually get there because now you have a narrow street and there is absolutely no space for a car and a bicycle. So for me, this is elimination of any possibility that this could ever be a biking uh, I think that there's a conflict uh, uh, by creating it, and, and I know that it is coming through the traffic, and, and I agree, and, and it looks pretty and it's very environmental, but I think it, it is uh, very uh, against the uh, So, So the comment or question was more that um, streetscapes tend to be a little bit against cycling because of the narrowing of the road and installing of the curbs. So um, the thing I would state about that is looking at it specifically in that sense, yes, you could make that argument. You also have to, we also, as when we're doing these designs, we look at the existing roadway in general and see what the roadway allows. So as you're going, for instance, the locations that we did on Greenwich Avenue most recently, you have parking all the way up and down that road. There's absolutely no space for, cyclists are required to utilize the roadway, the lane widths, because there's parking all the way up and down that road. Um, that's the only location for them. Ultimately, what could be done in a long-term sense would be look at taking Greenwich Avenue, potentially looking at eliminating parking, could be looking at eliminating two lanes and making it one lane with bike lanes on each side. Um, but you also have to look at the traffic impacts. You have to look at the parking impacts. Where, is that, where are those things going to be offset? If traffic patterns continue where people are not driving as much, if, vehicle, if there's less vehicles on the road, you can take that into consideration. Um, however, we just have to look at all those features and so by, if we were to take it from two lanes down to one lane, you would have this availability even on both sides to have a bike lane there. So those are all long-term things that we look at. And if we knew that there was an opportunity leading up to an intersection for cyclists to be, we're um, not going to um, install the streetscape that's going to really prevent that. Um, it's more to, you know, like we've, you know, like most of you've known and heard me say many places, you know, many other t times before. Greenwich is a very challenging community, with roadway widths, all the stuff that's on either side of the road, and where the property lines are. Our property where we have the roads is very narrow. Property lines are fairly close to the roadway, so any expansion to the roadway to accommodate bike lanes is very challenging. In addition, there's, you know, how many places do you see rock outcroppings and all this other stuff, what makes it very expensive. So these are all um, challenges we face. Um, and, you know, that's what I would, yes. I have, I have one more question. Um, we have to make the transition somehow, and I, I, I'm looking for your recommendations. How are we going to transition from showing that there's a need to, for example, close one of the lanes on Greenwich Avenue? Uh, should we, for example, start promoting bicycling or, or close the street, uh, maybe not Greenwich Avenue because I don't think it's a good example because it's just steep, but maybe we can have uh, these few roads and close them during the weekend for bicyclists so this way people can 
get used to the fact that actually bicycle is a way of transportation moving around. And then we will show the need because obviously one lane can uh, move more people on bicycles than on cars. And parking for the cars is just such a wasting of space. So um, if we can encourage this somehow and make this transition, any thoughts on this? It's, it's a very, very uh, the question was more like how can we improve um, bicycle awareness and improve the transition from vehicles to bicycles. Pretty much that's a, that's a good summary. Um, it's a very difficult, challenging question. It's kind of a, it becomes a mindset and I don't know really the good answer to it. Um, it's, you know, we hear, we hear many things going to many of these different meetings like this, um, and it depends on the crowd you're talking to. Um, a lot of people move from New York City, for instance, where maybe they were less vehicle dependent and less, you know, more pedestrian, more cyclist, more public transportation dependent, out to Greenwich or the surrounding area because they want the availability to get other places more freely and so having their vehicles and so forth so we hear that being a challenge um and it's you know it's not an easy answer and i don't really know what the answer is um you know our position our position as a town public works we try to keep monitoring these things we try to do what the community is looking for and um maintain you know Ultimately, our job is maintaining the current infrastructure and uh, keeping it up to current standards. So, thank you so so much, and um, I also thank everyone for the questions that were asked because it's obviously clear this requires a much much broader dialogue, and it will also take time. On the task force itself, we're trying to focus on things that can be achieved relatively quickly and easily enough. It's obviously very, very clear when we start to look at items like micro-mobility, changing commuting patterns, where exactly does work start, where does work stop, where does life begin, where is spare time. A lot of things have become a lot more fluid and that requires adjustments over time. And I think one good way to really do that is to engage in a dialogue. So the task force is obviously here as a liaison piece between the town executives and their day-to-day -day duties, but also with you, the general public. Uh, we love to get feedback. We'd like to have uh, reactions so that we can help prioritize and, and, and make sure that it becomes part of um, the agenda. Um, I particularly want to thank, you know, the Byram Neighborhood Associations or District 4, you know, for having joined tonight. Um, I think for Josh who spoke before and then Lucy as well. Um, we do want to reach out to BNA, but also to the schools, maybe the library, any other interesting interested parties and so on, so we can really drive this towards a community effort and you know, look at all the issues from maybe perspectives that we didn't see so that we get, the, get this right. Um, we do have a bit more time uh, tonight. Um, if there's more questions from the public or if there is comments, reactions, then please step forward and um, let's have that conversation point. Um, I'd like the task force members to go last oh. and recognize the public first if that is okay. All right. This is just a thought. Have you given any thought to possibly partnering with the local health services and or possibly like Greenwich Hospital because biking also does involve, it is good for public health. So have you thought of it from that perspective yet? So the question is whether we thought of potentially partnering, partnering more with like health organizations from the audience, particularly uh, Greenwich Hospital was mentioned. Um, when the question was asked, have you, I understand the task force, 
since we're fairly new, we haven't been there yet, yet we've been in touch with you know, various not-for-profits. When we try to build that community, there is one effort in town that is a strong voice for bicycling interest. It's called Pedal Greenwich. I need to disclose I'm a member of Pedal Greenwich as well, so I'm wearing two hats tonight. Uh, we had our community bike festival, which was also covered by the press. And in particularly one of the exhibitors we wanted to have there and we got invited and we invited and accepted right away was the community health area, community health department of Greenwich Hospital. And one of the reasons why that happened was their 2020 and 21 theme was bicycling safety. So that was part of their agenda and program. And in Old Greenwich on 925 that Saturday, they had their exhibit there and they interacted quite a bit uh, with the public. So at least on my mind, that, that was a good start. And, and yes, more to come. Um, I know um, from a Pedal Greenwich perspective, you know, Pedal Greenwich members with their capabilities have been in touch with many not-for-profits uh, in town and so on. So in a way, we, we hope to kind of build that coalition. It's just really important. It's overall traffic, right? So the drivers need the roads, the bicyclists have rights and duties, so have the pedestrians. Um, I don't have any statistics how many accidents and what kind of accidents and how severe they are uh, in, in Greenwich. Unfortunately, there's a number of them. There's a number of incidents that never really get uh, reported. Um, any accident is one too many, right? So clearly uh, the health aspects. Maybe in this long answer, one other aspect is that Community Bike Fest showed, or the conversations around it, there has been a lot of improvement in equipment safety. There's a lot that the bikers themselves can do to better, you know, show themselves to traffic, wearing dark clothes, not having any lights on, when now, you know, the sunlight goes away faster, is not really a very, very um, healthy uh, thing to do. So whether it's with more advanced tech gear, smartphones and apps and so on, or just simple things, there's much improved helmets, helmets with flashing triangles in the back and, and so on. Um, so I really think, um, there, 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 there's a lot of safety improvements that can be made by us individually. Um, I personally do hope that Greenwich Hospital, we also had Greenwich EMS there. We had the e-bicycling unit from Greenwich Police there. So everybody bicycling, safety, incidents, accidents help. Uh, better ways going forward, ultimately recreation or even quality of life. Um, I think the voice is rising, so that's good news. Makes me optimistic for 2022. Stephanie from the task force, you had a comment reaction? Well, I was, we were talking about streets. Do you want to come up and speak? The narrow roads here and what we can do, but I was thinking about the bump outs and how those would bottleneck it for bikers too, which is your point, right? You know, it might make it less safe for bikers, but in New York, with the, in New York City, which is where I come from and came out and that was one of the things that shocked me the most was coming out of the city and then sitting on my butt in the car all day. And it was, oh, I hate it. And just being able, like, I wish I could walk more places and bike more places. That's the reason I'm on the task force. And, but when they do bump outs like that, it does look beautiful and it slows down the cars, but they carve out part of that bump out for the bike lane. So then you get the best of both worlds because you have the bike lane and the bike lane goes through. And, um, but then you still get the shorter crossing for the pedestrians that you were talking about. You're not like in the road, in the road, in the road, in the road, you know, especially for kids. But anyway, that popped into my mind as it's uh, a way to address both concerns. Thanks. Jim, did you want to respond or? I think you know, not a lot to respond to, but I will just say that, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I've seen that and we've looked at that in the past and, um, the concern, the issue we have here, like you mentioned, is there's no bike lanes leading up to the intersections. So there's nothing to like lead into it. So if we left a gap there, you'd be 
running bikes across the intersection into parked cars on both sides potentially. So, um, you know, it's definitely something that if things were looked at moving forward, it can be looked at to be incorporated. But, um, you know, definitely, um, you know, any ideas we're always open for them. We don't have dates yet, um, and honestly, we don't have funding yet. So one of the things that's going to be put out there in this upcoming budget will be some of those um, possible um, improvement locations and requests for funding based upon that. We'll see how those, if you know, as everybody, as many of people know, the capital budget is always a very challenging process, long process, and. Um, there's lots of different things that get requested through the capital project process. And, um, you know, so there's always challenges to getting these things funded. Hi, Jim. Can you Not too bad. Um, as a new resident, how does the prioritization you made to say bump out and Byram? You mentioned that the Byram thing was just uh, you know, on the list for the last 10 years. I'm wondering. How did that get, how did that sort of break free and make it to the top? Had that been planned throughout the year? Was there some kind of assessment? And then secondly, you know, the same thing for like the bell numbers. I'm just trying to think about what are the prioritization, um, what, are, what are the ways in which these kinds of things are prioritized and how can this task force or others insert themselves into the process so that there are going to be uh, other points of view on how we prioritize. So the question was more or less um, how do certain things get prioritized for funding and how best can the task force um, support certain task force related budget requests? Correct? Is that a good summary? <laughs> so the it's a long process and I'm happy to talk to you right after the meeting about the full budget process, but really um, the town looks at all the different priorities what we've been given is guidelines by the finance board, the Board of Estimation and Taxation, um, that gives us primarily a main, what's considered a maintenance budget. We need to maintain what we already have first, and then if there's new initiatives, then... What percent of the budget is that? For public works, it's about 98% of it, to be honest. But... <laughs> Yeah, so that's primarily what um, we in public works are required to do. And then um, the remaining, pers you know, the remaining projects, we periodically will get a new project here or there. Um, and we oftentimes will seek grant funding. So part of the, um, the Byram project that is going on right now, that is a grant funded project. So that's funded through the state. And part of the reason it took a little bit longer is that the town had some concerns with the um, legal agreements between the town and the state for funding that uh, put the project on hold for a number of years. And we got those worked out now. So, um, so we do look at grant opportunities. We look at other financing opportunities. Um, but uh, each year, the you know, the process goes through, you know, the, first through the f selectman's office, then it goes to um, the BET, and then from there it goes on to the RTM. And each of those groups have opportunities to um, take their stab at the budget, so to speak. And so, for example, the Byron project, when was it known that that project was going to be done at that particular time? Is that something a year ago that that decision was made during the budget process? Or is that something that happened within the, the DPW infrastructure that um, allowed you to do that? So, like I mentioned, with that project specifically, um, we oftentimes we get the design funding first, and then we do from there we move it on to um, construction funding. So they'll come in different years. So initially we'll normally get design funding. Then from there we move it on to the construction funding. 
So most of the time you'll know a couple of years in advance of when a project's going to go on because the original project looks at the design funding piece. Um, so we look at, in public works, a variety of different initiatives. Um, safety as well being one of them. We try to reduce crashes as much as we possibly can. Um, and, that, and sometimes some of these improvements with streetscape and so forth can be helpful to that. So, um, you know, so those are all factors involved in the budgeting process. But and then who, so who signs off and says, okay, let's do Byron. When did that happen? When did, when did, and who was the one who put the check mark on it that's got to go and do There's a whole lot of people that get involved in that. So, you know, it, you know, when we, so was ultimate. That, was that RTM? RTM, RTM, okay. RTM has the last say on it. Let's let's go there. Um, BET is the next to last say, and then selectman's office, and then public works. You know, is the starting point. We in each year, like right now, on my desk and before this meeting, I was sitting there working on the budget for next year already, and seeing what projects we're going to be looking to put forward to the for selectman's office for that. Got it. So, so just to be clear. Um, that Byron project was on a list that, that people at the RTM said yes to, and then that meant that you were tasked with doing it in this calendar year, or this fiscal year, is that what happened? Or was there a general budget that was passed, and then within the DPW, executives there made the decision to do that Byron project as opposed to a different project? That's kind of... So most, almost all projects, any project that's the size of the Byron project is a specific allocation for that specific project. It's not a generalized allocation for any sort of work across town. Um, that specific project was um, approved and it's, the hope is that it gets constructed within that one calendar year. Sometimes there's, you know, we put into our write-up about the project approximate estimated timeframes um, so that's, you know, that's where we, where it gets into like the exact details, but most projects are specific to this two block segment or something like that is a project that we're going to do, or this specific intersection, something we're going to do, it's going to cost this amount and this is, and then it goes through the review process. Got it. So if we back up the bicycle task force, then we got to be looking at design things that are currently being um, uh, look, you're looking for funding for right now. That would be one way to get involved in the Right, either that or looking at other opportunities. So, for instance, a, you know, a couple years ago, we um, we looked at cycling. What's the, the name of the app? Is Strava, I believe. Strava. Strava, right? Um, we pulled data off of that to see what the most highly utilized through that app are for cycling. And we installed an extra, we added 30 uh, cycling signs throughout town on some of those routes to make people aware that there may be cyclists in these locations. So they're basically a diamond shaped sign that has a bicycle on it that's like a fluorescent yellow color. So we added those in a various higher volume spots those are not um, specific initiative that we had a specific budget item for. We worked it into our sign budget because we do have a generalized sign budget. But things like that we can look at and um, see if there's a couple bike rack locations or things like that that might be helpful or some pavement markings. One thing that we've tried to, I try to do a little bit on some of our roads when we repave them, if they're a busier road, um, when we restripe, we try to pull, you know, Ernst was bringing up the fact that there's the white lines on the edges of the road and it doesn't leave much room for anything else. We will try to, if we can, bring those white lines in a little bit so that there's maybe a two foot shoulder or something rather than just right at the edge of the asphalt. Um, we have to keep a certain width for road, for vehicles to travel, but we can narrow them down sometimes because um, there is sometimes a little extra space. So if there's certain roadways that uh, 
you identify as you know areas that could look at that improvement to say hey these lanes look pretty wide maybe we could bring the white line in a little bit that's a possible opportunity or if some roads are pretty wide and they don't have a white line along the edge um, we can talk about having you know maybe adding a white line that would give a little bit of a area to the side for um, cyclists one one thing to you know just so everybody here is aware and I know I've said this to probably everybody that's here but bike lanes if we add a bike lane to a road each bike lane has to be at least five feet wide and it has to be on both sides of the road so really we need an extra 10 feet to do bike, official bike lanes we if we can mark it as a wider shoulder at three foot or whatever but we can't put the little bike symbol in the lane there so just and there's I can't think of a single road that we have an extra 10 feet of pavement sitting around on in town anywhere. So um, if anybody finds one, let me know. I can uh, look at it. So, Where does the regulation come from that you have to have it on both sides? It's a federal standard. Federal? Yes. It's through the MUTCD. So. What about share roads? What's the standard on that? Is there Share roads are available to be placed in... Um, on the travel lane. They're more for um, awareness. They're not marking an official bike lane, but they're just more for awareness of there's a high possibility you'll run into um, bikes in this area. Um, that's something we've been exploring doing. Um, you know, so. Um, uh, personally, I I think I would see a shero on the pavement more than I would see a sign with a diamond. Um, I haven't, I just happen to have noticed a, a couple of the signs, whereas um, in other places like Stanford has a lot of sheros and I, I noticed those on the road and I think, and I was wondering also if, if you have a certain amount of lane that you have to have for cars, why can you not always make the strike there and have whatever's left over be, as opposed to say, oh well, a lot of bikes don't, no, not that many bikes ride on this road, so we'll go ahead and give the cars a little extra room as opposed to maybe if you scrunch the cars in a little bit, you would get more bike traffic. So, so um, answering I'll try and answer the question and say the question at the same time. So we don't, we try not to, well, the width of the road, the lane width is really, um, we look at it based upon the volume of traffic as well. So if there's higher volumes of traffic, higher um, areas where we know that there's known truck traffic or whatever because that's the pathway that they're allowed to take, um, or needing to take, the lanes may be a little bit wider. So there's not, we have a range where we place those lanes, and so that's um, wh why we decide which where to put those lines. Um, going out and changing all the lines, it, we don't, we try to do that when we repave roads. That's so, I yeah, so, um, so there's that. In addition, one thing, you know, to bring up is a lot of roads in this town do not have stripes on them um, people you know some people like to not have that stripe because they feel putting the pavement r markings on the road makes it much, look much more urban and um, makes it look more like a city and pe some people like to have that kind of more rural country type feel to themselves or more you know the back country and so forth like don't like the striping on the road so we try to we try to honor as much as we can what the will of the residents in general are. So that's what we're trying to do. So. Yeah. This is a very, very long work day for you, Jim. So thank you so much for your availability. It's very, very much appreciated. And I also want to thank for the audience um, 
active participation and questions and, and, and comments. We do need to bring this meeting to an end. I just would like, again, thank everyone, also the ones who attended via Zoom. The next meeting will be in November, logically, obviously, after Election Day. So we don't have a fixed day or time, but it will be communicated on our website. Um, as I mentioned before, um, from a task force perspective, um, I really have been getting that consistent impression now over the last few weeks that bicycling, pedestrian safety, alternative transportation, including environmental type of uh, issues are for real. And we'll probably see that around the election days as well. But I, I, I really get the sense that uh, the town is trying hard to be committed to this. And you know, within the priorities and the possibilities, I usually summarize it like this, we got the space we got the money issues and we got the time. So it's not always too easy to, to juggle those, but uh, what can help is really a dialogue. Um, the task force is uh, listed on the town's website. Um, if anybody has reactions, comments, um, correspond with the task force via the normal town channels, that's uh, possible. Hopefully, um, we were not allowed to have more than 26 people in the room uh, tonight. It would be nice to have larger public meetings. We'll just inform on that as, as things develop. And with that said, I want to quickly finish with this, uh, particularly for our friends in Byram, because we made that the focus item over the last few weeks. Let's please have that dialogue. We'd like to hear back from the Byram Neighborhood Association and friends and other Byram experts, we really within the task force would like to nominate two, three immediate action items so that the town will schedule them. We'll be pushing from at least the community representative side from on the task force that these things get done in this current like fiscal cycle. So things that really realistically are possible um, even during the winter weeks or months so that by spring we can really say this got done. Um, we would appreciate the support and the involvement. So with all that said, another big, big shout and thank you to Jenny on behalf of technology at the town. It wasn't just Jenny alone. There were three, four, five other people behind the scenes. So just want to express a great, great sincere thank you to the town. This has been super tech support as well. So thank you so much and have a good evening.